You are listening to the Mindset Forge podcast, where I interview athletes and performing artists on how they show up for the big moments of life. I'm your host, Barton Bryan. I'm a former singer, an athlete, and personal trainer, and I love interviewing people to find out how they've learned to show up big when it counts most. I'm speaking today with Luke Walton. He's a former NBA basketball player and two-time NBA champion with the Los Angeles Lakers. He played nine years with the Lakers, all with Kobe Bryant, and most of those years with Phil Jackson as the coach. His perspective, finding value and being the best possible teammate, lends a perspective not just on being the best, but being on the best team and how you can add an extreme amount of value by doing the little things to help everybody on your team to be better. Growing up the son of Hall of Fame basketball player Bill Walton, Luke got a lot of advice. One of the things that Bill did say was a great player makes everyone around him better. And Luke made a name for himself on the Lakers doing exactly that making Kobe, Lamar Odom, Pau Gasol better by being on the court with him. Luke and I talk about him as an athlete and of course when he and the Lakers went on to win titles with Kobe and Phil Jackson. At the end of the interview we do talk about Steve Kerr and the Golden State Warriors when he was an assistant coach and they had that 73 win season back in 2016. On a personal note, Luke's actually my cousin, a lot younger than me, but I grew up hanging out at Bill's house in the summertime with my older brother, Gordon, and we'd play a lot of basketball with Luke, Adam, Nate, and Tuffy. It was really interesting seeing Luke evolve into an incredible basketball player. He was much younger than me and trying to, to keep up, and then all of a sudden he just eclipsed everybody and made it to the NBA. So just really fun to interview him here, ask him some questions that I've wanted to ask him for a while. That being said, I hope you enjoy this interview with Luke Walton. Luke, uh, I want to get right into being a rookie. You get drafted by the Lakers. Mm -hmm. 2003, it's the year that LeBron comes out in the draft. You're drafted by the Lakers. Kobe, Shaq, Carl Malone, Gary Payton. Those are just some of the top names yeah. on that team. You go right into the limelight. Yeah. Talk about that as a rookie and kind of what were some of the lessons you learned right away being on that team? Well, it was, it, it was a shock for sure. I mean, it's like a dream come true. So you're... Um, as a young man, you're balancing like you're living a dream, but the reality of like you you better you better figure this thing out if you want to stay in this dream, right? So uh, I get drafted to the Lakers, and it wasn't easy at, at, at the beginning at all. A lot of the vets on our team that you named, uh, they had some history with Big Bill, and and they didn't they weren't big fans of Big Bill. Uh, Big Bill being my father, uh, Bill Walton, and uh, they they took that out on me early in training camp. Uh, a little bit of hazing, a, in a, a lot of hazing, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a, lot so, of a lot of hazing. hazing, and they were open about it. These are big time players and, yeah. and big time personalities, so they weren't trying to hide it. My life was going to be hard that first year, and um, I learned a lot from those guys. I learned a lot from that experience. It was really the first time. You know, I, I would play randomly throughout that year, spot minutes, um, but everyone was a lot better than me, uh, you know, on, on that team. That was a championship caliber team and, and full of grown men. Uh, so it, it was really about, uh, one, connecting to my teammates because that's who I always wa w you know, was as a player and how I could do that in, in this new role of joining an, an NBA team and uh and then two what i could learn from them and, and, and how i could how i could help myself and, and my team grow uh to where i can make it in this league and you know with within a few months uh, you know I, I won them over as far as you know they put all the hazing aside and uh and embraced me as one of one of them and one of their teammates and uh you know from that point on it was really just just learning as much as I could from the way they worked, from uh, the way they performed uh, in pressure situations to um, just different dynamics that, uh, that as a young basketball player, you're so lucky to have that opportunity. And of course, the coach was Phil Jackson. Yeah. So you have you know, the Zen master there kind of leading that entire crew. What do you remember early about kind of the mindset of Phil and what did you uh, remember right off like wow like that is really unique to what to what we're trying to do? Well, he was just so great at um 
at understanding basketball as you know each game taking on its own life and and how to build momentum and how to get his players to to see the game and to play the game really as as a five man unit and that was the you know one of the beautiful things about the triangle offense was all five players were an option on every possession uh, even though most of the possessions ended up in Kobe's the ball in Kobe's hands um to see you know to get to camp to training camp and to see him just start to teach it and then and really have the ability to get uh so many different people uh, on board with it and to understand it gave us um I, I thought a huge advantage of, you know when we went out and played other teams um but he he was he was just brilliant at understanding what he needed to coach and what he needed to teach and not really letting any of the other craziness of playing on the Lakers and the the you know it was a yeah. rock star mentality it was thousands of people outside the hotel wherever we went and None of that got to Phil. He was focused on what we had to do as a team and how he was going to teach it. And he was brilliant at just kind of tuning out everything else. That's an ability that, you know, really has led him to being, you know, the greatest coach our game's ever seen. Yeah. Talk about momentum because I, I really love that term in terms of like, you know, finding momentum within a game, like the, you know, the game kind of unfolds and, and you, you may be hot, you may not be, but how is he helping and trying to get the team to catch momentum? The whole thing within the triangle offense was, you know, one pass is, is, is going to activate what comes next in the offense. Mm-hmm. And he would break it down to such a fundamental level. Um, you know, we used to sit and practice as professionals and all those players you name, and we'd spend the first 10 minutes of every practice doing footwork drills, doing what he called, you know, the Tex winner passing drill, which is like we're literally throwing chess passes to each other. Mm -hmm. Then we throw right-handed bounce passes. Then we throw left-handed bounce passes. And it's like this is the highest level, the most talented players in the world. (laughs) You feel like you're wasting your time sometimes, and it's boring. Uh, But he would explain. He said, look, if you throw one bad pass to the pinch post – now he catches it, his, foot, his, his feet aren't where they should be. Mm-hmm. Now when the cut comes over, the defense has us pushed out further. So the understanding of, uh, of every little thing that happens on each play is going to determine how that play ends. And then how that play ends is going to determine what our defense looks like. And there's just constant flow in life during the game, and we have to do our best to, to be in control of that flow yeah. and build positive momentum. Even if we miss a shot, if we have three nice passes and the spacing is good and the rhythm is good, throughout that 48-minute game, we're going to make more of those shots than we're going to miss. Yeah. And we're going to spend time working on all these little fundamentals uh, that other teams you know, don't probably aren't doing. Yeah, That's in life. And, and he found the importance of bringing that to what he did for right. a living, which was coach basketball. Right. You find that rhythm and then it allows you individually or your team uh, to, to find the flow that athletes are looking for all the time. Yeah, love it. You hear all these stories about John Wooden. He taught the athletes to put their socks on the yeah. right way because yeah. if one blister could mean less time on the floor, it could mean the loss of the game, you know, like breaking it down to such a minute level, yeah. but making it important that we understand every level is important. Yeah, and yeah. these are some of the greatest coaches in the world. Yeah. And it's, it's, there's <laughs> a reason for it. Yeah, <laughs> and they, they find the value in the, in the simplicity and the importance in the fundamentals. And then it's about repetition. So one of the teammates that you spent most of your career with was Kobe Bryant. Mm-hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, there was kind of an early uh, part of your relationship where you showed up to practice not at your best, maybe a little hungover, uh, and Kobe kind of reamed you for it. I think there might be a lesson in, in like how that relationship started and what Cody taught you. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad moment. I don't mind talking about it because I learned a lot from it. People... 
love talking about the the mamba mentality and, and and to see it live was just it was it was so incredible uh his, his the power of the mind i, I is, is really like I, i've never seen anyone else use or or take to their advantage as much as Kobe did. Mm -hmm. uh, his, his mindset was unbelievable. Uh, his competitive spirit was unbelievable. And um, like Phil and like John Wooden, his attention to detail, uh, which to me comes back to your mindset, uh, was at a level that I've never seen. You know, the rest of us, we a lot of times would play two on two, three on three after practice. He'd get to a rim by himself and work on the fundamentals of the pinch post part of the offense and where he was going to get his shots from for hours. And, and I'm talking about to the, the, the way he caught the ball, to the, his pivots he was using, to counters. It was just unbelievable. And a lot of that, I think, would be boring for some people. And for him, it was there was, there was beauty in it, and he, he absolutely loved it. Um, but as far as, yeah, I was, again, I was 23 years old and playing for the Lakers and uh, went out drinking too much one night, came in a little hungover the next day, thought I'd kind of hide, and there was a lot of players playing ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And when he sniffed out that I, I, I probably had too much to drink the night before, uh, he called me out. He said, you're guarding me, you're guarding me all practice long, and nobody is helping you. And I kind of laughed thinking he was messing around. He was dead serious. Um, but again, it was a great learning moment for me because one, it was the mentality of like, what's the most important thing? And that, that's our team is ready to play and we're ready to win. Right. And two, like you see an advantage, take it, go after it, like pick, like keep going. And, and where we got as a team eventually is we found weaknesses on other teams, just like he picked on me that whole day of practice mm -hmm. like we would manipulate the offense um that we all learn together and and just keep picking the scab all day long um and that was a lesson i learned early on in, in the nba is one you better always be ready and two you see you see an advantage like be ready to take advantage of it mm -hmm. uh but the only way you'll you'll be able to is if you've put in that work uh getting to that point so when there is something an opportunity comes for you or there's something that you that you can do to help your team win you got to be ready for it right. and uh yeah he 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 abused me that day <laughs> in practice it was yeah. it was it was uh it made me question whether or not i uh, belonged in the in this league or not that's cool so a couple of years into it being a, a player you really hit your stride 2006 specifically was probably your best statistical season you were starting for the lakers uh talk about kind of where you found your like your value to the team yeah. like how how you figured out okay where can i be most valuable as a teammate as a as a, as a player and just that kind of evolution to that role yeah it's, it's everyone that makes the nba is one of the top 400 players in the in the entire world right so up to that point like you you've kind of been the man wherever you go right. and i think that's where a lot of players get in trouble um is you you finally get your chance in the NBA, and it's like, well, no, I'm the man. I got to shoot the ball. I got to score the ball. Mm -hmm. um, I need plays called for me. Like, I've had plays called for me my whole life. Yeah. And then you get to the NBA, and what you find is, like, you better be better than the other 400 player, best 400 players in the world at something. So if you want to be the man and you want plays called for you, you better be on our team, you better be more efficient than Kobe Bryant, Lamar Odom, Pal Gasol is. Yeah. Um, and if you're not, why why the hell are we running plays for you, right? So <laughs> yeah. I understood that. And you know, where a lot of players will struggle with that and, yeah. and blame the coach and blame whoever else and not getting the right opportunities. Yeah. Um, for me, I had no problem being unselfish. I love, I love passing the ball. I always found the beauty in that. I, you know, again, the only thing that really mattered to me was trying to win. Um, you know, and how can I help our team win? It was to play make. 
It was to to find ways to get Kobe easier shots. It was to pass up my own look to to get Lamar cutting dunk to try to get him going. Yeah. And I quickly found that playing that way, all my teammates wanted me on the court all the time. Yeah. And Phil loved it. So it took some time to swallow your your pride and your ego, but if it's really what you want, you find a way uh, to get it done. And for me, as I lived through that and felt it out, this isn't like punishment. This is really fun to play this way. Yeah. And my teammates love it. My coach loves it. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to get to the pinch post as often as I can. I'm going to play make out of it. And we had success as a team. And I had joy and in, in success as a, as a player and was able to, to play in the league for 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm wondering, your dad played for the Celtics for a couple of years yeah. and he got kind of stuck in San Diego playing for the Clippers for a while, which yeah. I don't know if that was the best basketball that was going on at that time. But when he went to the Celtics, you and your family moved out to Boston. You were surrounded by Larry Bird, Kevin McHale. Yeah. I mean, some of the greatest players of all time. Do, do you feel like any of that unselfish understanding of basketball might have come early just from like seeing that, that winning culture? Absolutely. Uh, 100%. Because it's really like the first memories I have of basketball. Mm. And I remember being at their practices and watching their team, their games on TV. That was one of the most unselfish teams of all time. And they had Hall of Famers yeah. all over that roster. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that had an influence on as I grew up playing, like how I wanted to play. I, I loved I loved watching that team play and, and how unselfish they were. Um, my dad used to always talk about if you want to be great, make your teammates better. That's what great players do. Mm. They don't go out and score 40 and, and everyone else on their team struggles. If you want to be great, make the players around you better, right? So um, as, you're, as I'm growing up in, in playing basketball in elementary school and high school and the best player on my team, that kind of always stuck with me. It is like, okay, this is what he's talking about. Let's make everyone on the team a problem for our opponents yeah. not just try to score every time I get the ball so uh, I think between watching those Celtics teams every day as a kid um, and, and what my dad was constantly preaching around the house made it easier for me to kind of fall into that role yeah well you had Wooden's pyramid on the wall we had it on the wall. We had it on <laughs> our lunch bags. John Wooden was was God in our house. Everything other than waking up on Sunday morning and praying to him, there was John Wooden. Yeah. Uh, you know, all just painted all over the house. It was an interesting childhood, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. You mentioned Powell, Lamar Odom, Kobe, you, and then of course you had like Derek Fisher and some of the, some great players on that team. And you end up three years in a row going to the finals two of which you won. Uh, talk about those years and just really like getting all the way to the finals, the pinnacle of basketball, and what that was like and kind of what you learned in those moments. I'll start by saying it is so hard. It is so hard to win a championship at, at, at this level. Um, the, you have to have the talent, you have to have luck, and you have to have a group of guys um, that is so bought into the team over the individual to even have a chance at winning it. I'll tell you this, I don't think it would have happened without losing the first two championships mm -hmm. that we were in. My rookie year, we, we got to the finals and, and lost to Detroit. Um, and you know, you kind of think, oh, okay, well, we lost this one, we'll be back next year. Like, as a young player, you don't know, know better. No. Then you go, however, six straight years of scrapping and fighting and giving everything you have, trying to get back, yeah. and you don't. That builds up a toughness um, as long as you have a core that's together, and we we were lucky enough that we had that core, and the Lakers were a stable organization, and Phil was the coach for most of that time. Mm -hmm. um, so we had our coach, we had our core group of guys, we were constantly trying to bring in uh, you know, make that, that team better. Um, and, and really the piece that got us over the hump to get back to that level, at least of, of really competing for a title was bringing in Powell. 
and we bring power in and we get back to the finals. And it's like, all right, come on, we got to win this one now. We work so hard to get back. Yeah. And then Boston cracks us in game six. And I, that was the most painful uh, basketball experience I've ever had. That game six. That game six. They yeah. won by 30. They, it was the elimination game. We thought we were the better team. We thought we were going to finally win our championship. And they start celebrating with three minutes on the clock. And they're up 20, pouring Gatorade everywhere. So now we got to stop the game, clean the court. We're so just it's... sitting there. And, and the <laughs> Boston arena is going nuts. It took us two and a half hours to get five miles to our hotel after the game because the streets were just... Yeah. They're rioting out there. They, they, the police had no. We had a police escort that didn't really care how long it took <laughs> us to get back. It was Boston, you know, right. Boston. They yeah. give them credit. They're a sports fan. They, they party after they win. And I just remember as a team, we all went back to the hotel and we sat there, had some drinks, and talked about how much this hurt and how we were going to do everything that we were capable of to to make sure that we didn't feel this way again next year. Yeah. And um, it sounds good, and it's, you know, da-da-da-da-da. We get to the off season, Everyone kind of goes their own ways. You're, you know, you're getting a text from Kobe at 7 a.m. What are you doing right now? Are you working, right? How so are you making you, yourself better? Yeah, seriously. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, and it's like, okay, so then you text Lamar. Lamar, where you at? You know what I mean? So, like, there, yeah. we had this team full of, of really talented players that had been together for a while now. The failure of that Boston series was so motivating. Yeah. We we're already motivated people, but it took us to a level yeah. that I'd never been on uh, uh, from a team aspect, like how focused a team was uh, that next season. Yeah. Um, so when we, and even that next season, we hit some bumps. You always never smooth sailing. Uh, but that next season, when we got back into the finals, mm -hmm. There was no way we were losing. There was zero chance we were losing. Um, but again, I, I don't think our mindset, it can't even be that sharp and at that level without going through the failure of losing the year before. Right. Um, and when we finally won in Orlando, it was the greatest, just most rewarding experience of, of my basketball career. It was just, yeah. it was unbelievable. We were on the road, which kind of made it special. You want to be at home, but being on the road, it's like, Everyone's back at the hotel together afterwards. Right. When you went at home, everyone's got parties right. and people and family. family got, yeah. It, it's we had a ballroom at the Orlando hotel, and it was the coaches and the players, and we, the the Lakers uh, had flown out like a family plane for the closeout game. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a, a small amount of people, and we just we celebrated every one of us together, uh, yeah. and it was just it was it was amazing. Um, and then we went back again the next year. The, th the, th the three, like you said, three years in a row. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, and it was Boston, the Oof. team that had just done to us what they did two years right. ago. And, and they were, I mean, come on, that team is one of the best teams ever. Yeah. Um, and, and they got Kevin Garnett, Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, and, and they're fully loaded. Rashid Wallace was on that team, and um, back and forth, game seven. Uh, and I saw uh, the the three pointer that, and game sevens are always sloppy. NBA final game sevens. Yeah. The, if you're a gambling the nerve, man, take the, the under. Like the, it's like the nerves the are nerves just ridiculous. Are, yeah, it makes incredibly talented players make dumb bad mistakes. Yeah. Uh, and we lived through it and we played it. Um, and Meta Meta hit the, the the three pointer where he gave the greatest post game speech of all time about he heard Phil in his head using the Zen Master telling him <laughs> not to shoot, uh, and he knocked it down and we beat Boston in Game Seven. Especially like the whole circle of life coming from the fact that I grew up the most diehard Celtics fan of all time, right? And, and being on the other side of that rivalry to being able to play in that. Uh, in that same league and play for the other side of it. And that was really my family now. Yeah. Uh, and to knock out Boston and seven was pretty awesome. Before we go on to being a coach, cause I want to talk about that too. Right at the end of your career, you got traded to the Cleveland Cavaliers mm -hmm. and oftentimes that happens and you kind of, that's it. You kind of, they just, they wave you or they're going to buy you out and that's, yeah. but you had a little bit of a, 
kind of an end of year, I don't know what to call it specifically, but there was a, you kind of found a place where you were able to kind of inject something into that team. Yeah. And there was actually a term like the Luke effect, I mean, it, but they were talking about how you at the end of your career were able to do something, really still contribute. Do you remember specifically what, what that was, what happened in Cleveland? Yeah, so we had gone to three straight finals. It was tough because then Phil retired. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Brown came in and like the, everything was, was changing. A fish got traded away. Um, and it was like this whole family. It's all I'd ever known in the NBA. It was like, it was pretty much they were going in another direction. They were going to, mm -hmm. you know, try to, to, uh, you know, to give Kobe another shot, but with different types of players. Mm -hmm. So Lamar got traded, I got traded, Fish was gone, uh, and that was really painful. Um, and, and my trade sent me to Cleveland. And it was at the trade deadline, the rest of that first year is like, I was in a dark place. It was like, I, I, it was hard. I couldn't, I, it, it wasn't fun. It was like, it should be fun. I mean, it's the right. NBA still. Yeah, you're still in the and NBA, it's right. like, the, come on, this is, we're playing basketball for a living, right? Yeah. We're, the, we're the luckiest people in the world to do this. Um, but you were going to Cleveland. LeBron had just gone to Miami, Miami a few years so, before that. Yeah, so Cleveland they were, was a full rebuild. Yeah. They, they had, they had Kyrie. They just drafted Kyrie. Okay. And then that summer they drafted Dion Waiters and Tyler Zeller. But it was pretty much... Yeah. It, Full give rebuild. us as many young draft pit player picks and players as we can, and right. we're in rebuild mode. Yeah. Um, and coming back the next year, I you know I made the the, the I, I realized like okay, Luke, figure yourself out. Like right. like spend some time and like get your mind right because it always comes back to the mind. Like how do you perceive things is going to be your reality of what you're living. And for me, I was somehow convinced myself that like this wasn't fair and I'm in Cleveland and we're not playing for championships mm -hmm. anymore. And it's like, what are you talking about? You're playing basketball for a living. Right. Like you have young players, you have a lot to teach just like you as a young player got to learn from obviously players that were much greater than me, mm -hmm. but I still learn from, you know, even Horace Grant who was on that team who wasn't yeah. playing much. He, I, I'd learned a ton from Horace. So now I have a chance 10 years into my career mm -hmm. to teach a team full of young players about what I've learned in the game and how I like how we play. Um, so I came back that last year with no expectations other than I'm going to have as much fun playing basketball the right way. And it was funny because the, the starting lineup was all 20 and 21 year old kids. Mm -hmm. And the second unit was like Sean Livingston me, Wayne Ellington, CJ Miles. So like it was all these vets, like right. role playing vets right. in the second unit. In the first unit was all these potential young players. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it ended up being one of the most fun years I had in the NBA mm -hmm. as far as just playing basketball and, and really trying to, to share some of the knowledge I had learned a, a, along my journey with younger players we had a great time there in Cleveland that year. Yeah. And then a few years after you retire, you have the opportunity to go with Steve Kerr, who gets the head coaching job over for the Golden State Warriors, and you, you come on board as an assistant coach. Talk about that team, first of all. I mean, one of the, talk about one of the great teams yeah. of all time. But what that was, that culture that you got to be a part of in that, and, and specifically Steve Kerr and how he led uh, yeah, he was great. We took the job, and Steve had never coached before. I had never coached before. Uh, Jaron Collins had never coached before. Uh, we had Alvin Gentry and Ron Adams, who had both been coaching in the league for 30-plus years. Um, and we, Steve put his staff together and then said, you know, let's, let's go to Napa and go on a coach's retreat. Let's go watch as much film as we can on this team. And I, 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 I still feel like it was just a few months ago. We were sitting in this hotel in Napa, and we had the video guy there playing. We just watched game after game after game. And I remember Steve you know, looking at us and being like, guys, I don't think any of us realize how lucky. Like, this team is unbelievable. Like, the talent on this team is insane. 
what we have to do is one get them to understand like we're not coming in here trying to say hey this is about us and this is how we're going to do it now like this team like mark jackson did a good job with this team mm -hmm. like they've already had success they've been to the playoffs we have to come in priority number one is get them to know that that like we're here for them get them to trust us whatever it takes the time the work and then two get them to buy into a system of how we want to play and with this group passing split cuts ball movement is going to be almost impossible for teams to to guard us right so like that that was kind of the message coming out of the coaches retreat mm -hmm. and, and steve is he's one of the best i've ever seen at being able to to feel uh which i, I think he also learned from phil like feel the energy and the life of what's happening with certain players um and how to get a group to to buy in and commit to to a team so uh you know after that he went and flew to australia to meet with bogut flew to la to meet with dre and and steph and carolina so like he started putting in the time to earn their trust like right. i'm here for you guys right. i'm gonna come to you um, yeah, i'm gonna meet you exactly on your turf, on your turf. meet your family all, yeah, all of it and you know he's such a great guy that once you get to know him it's easy to to trust him and to want to like him yeah um and then it was about getting them to buy into the team and the system. And I still remember one of the ballsiest things he did was uh, ask Andre Iguodala to come off the bench. I mean, Andre was an all-star. The guy had started every game in his career pretty much for right. however many years it had been up to that point. Um, and he asked Andre for, you know, it'll be better for our team if you can anchor us coming off the bench and, and Harrison can play. Harrison was very young still at the time, can play with the starting group. Yeah. Um, and Andre wasn't happy about it. He's like, he's an all-star. Mm -hmm. um, but he accepted it. And, and, what, and the, the beauty of what Steve did there was at that point, no player was allowed to complain about anything. Like zero, if, if Andre is willing to come off the bench, nobody can complain about shots minutes anything right. um and i thought that was just brilliant uh, of steve now andre still finished every game andre still played 30 <laughs> minutes a game so yeah. it was like he was a starter but steve had had set a tone with uh, you know yeah team first team first yeah and and, and sacrifice yeah uh and it was it was beautiful to watch that yeah. so you got the warriors going through that 73 mm -hmm. win season you get to be a big part of that because steve throws out his back yeah. So for, for a chunk of that, you're the head coach. Talk about just stepping into that role and just facilitating that incredible run. Again, it showed the, the power of uh, what a, a united group can do uh, because I wasn't ready for that at all. And, uh, I, you know, the, the fact Steve trusted me with that was, you know, was amazing. Yeah. Um, but really what it came down to was, uh, we had a, a team full of, of players and coaches that believed in each other. Going back to what we just talked about, uh, the culture uh, that Steve wanted and wanting players to trust and uh, to know we had their backs paid off big time. Because I, one, I had a great relationship with Andre from Arizona. I played with Sean Livingston in Cleveland. He was on that team. Um, Draymond was my guy. I was working with Draymond uh, every day. Um, and when Steve went out, those guys all stepped up and mm -hmm. you know, I was, I was, I'm not going to lie. I was nervous as all hell going into that. We had come up, we just won a championship, right? No matter what, we can't patch that. What if we come up, start slow? You know, uh, the GM, Bob Myers, fantastic sitting by me on every preseason game in my ear. Like it doesn't matter. We're losing preseason games yeah. and I'm smart enough to know that. Yeah, we just want a championship. Our guys are playing 12 minutes a night they in the preseason. Care. They right. don't care, right. uh, but we're losing. And in my head, I'm like, holy shit, this is going to be, I'm not ready for this. Um, but I have to show that I am because I'm head coaching the team. Right. So, I, you know, I have to, uh, fake it till you make it type of thing. And, uh, but you built the relationships, talk about Draymond and, and the previous yeah. friendships and stuff from the league that yeah. allowed them to kind of like say, we're going to, we're going to support you. 100%. And, yeah. 100%. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they did. And, Cause I think, I forget what our record was in the preseason, but it wasn't great that year. 
and before the regular season started, I remember um, Draymond saying, don't worry about this. We got you. Right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, again, I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. Right. Because right? I'm the head coach. You got to show it. And then, uh, yeah, we, we came out of the gates rolling. And you know, yeah. I think we started like 24-0. and 0, uh, And we were just, we were having a blast. And it was yeah. it was so much fun. The, the toughest part of, of that whole thing was like Steve, who – has given me this opportunity and has trusted me and is maybe the greatest guy I know. Mm -hmm. Like while the whole team that he has put in this culture right. and we've won because of the culture he's put in and obviously the talent of the players right. get, get most of the credit, but he's in so much pain. He can't even come to games. Yeah. So like you're balancing this incredible amount of joy you're having with this, fact that you feel awful that the guy who He's kind of set up this whole bed. thing yeah. doesn't get a doesn't get to be part of it uh, yeah. from a standpoint of being in the buildings and that practices and all that yeah. um, so that that was that was tough but it was magical well and the, the trust that he had I mean the the safe decision for Steve Kerr at that moment was he had two assistant coaches with tons of, of NBA well, experience Alvin had left so Alvin okay. Was oh, because he went. He had gone to the New, New Orleans job. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Ron. then Ron. He had Ron, who had been there for like thirty years. But yeah. I think again, it's like you, you make tough choices. I think Steve knew that with that group of players, yeah. um, and where we were as a team, my type of personality, the relationships I had with those guys was was the right call. His ability to see what is happening within a group and what needs to, to be said or done is, is as high level as anyone I've ever been around. Yeah, I mean, I'm wondering, you, know, you being that kind of glue guy on the Lakers and understanding how you could really you know, be a immense value to the team by passing and trying to make everyone better, I feel like Draymond Green yeah. is that guy yeah. with a crap ton of attitude, yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. awesome to watch yeah. him. People in general, we chase stats. We, chase, we want to be the highest scorer on the team. We want to get the MVP, but like, talk about the whole concept of like trying to be more like Draymond Green. Mm. Like if you're a young athlete listening to this and you know, have a little bit of respect and, and for Draymond Green, what he's doing versus people that we you know, are at such a high level that probably very few people could ever get that at. Yeah, it's, it's just as important. You're not, I promise you that at least the, I'll speak for the, the time I was in Golden State, we don't win a championship without Draymond. In fact, we probably lost the second one because he got suspended for a game uh, when we were up 3-1. And, and the value that it brings, um, the importance it has to, to any successful team, it, it's huge. You need guys like that. Um, and you might not get the – Draymond's done a nice job. He's, he's got a lot of fame because of how good he is and I think a lot of his personality brings out defensive player of the years and stuff like that um, but you you won't get the the same uh, notice that you will if you're the highest scorer uh, but it's very rewarding and it's very important to any type of winning team workplace culture speaking from experience yeah I mean it's like my dad always said great players make their teammates better Right. So maybe I wasn't a great player in the NBA, um, but I had a 10 year career, I won championships um, and was able to succeed because I was out there making my teammates better. Draymond 100 percent makes his teammates better. Steph is one of the greatest players of all time. When you put Draymond out there, it's like you combine that the, the power they have mm -hmm. and, and both of them are 10 times better when they have each other out there. You got to give Draymond a, a, all the credit in the world for understanding that and going out every single night and having that grit to play that way is awesome. And it's a lot of fun to watch. So you're a dad. So yeah. talk to the dads and moms out there that have kids that are interested in sports. And, and we know that parents you know, in the sporting world can get a little crazy. Yeah. What should we be focused on for these kids? Yeah, to me, that's an easy answer. And I lived it with my dad. It, it's have fun. Have fun playing sports. Sports are meant to be fun, right? At, at a certain age, it depends what age parents you're talking to, but play a lot of different sports. Have fun doing all. If you're going to commit to it, commit to it. Be at practice, go to games, but have fun. Uh, it's not so much about winning and losing right now. Like mm -hmm. everyone wants to win. 
Uh, more importantly, it's about developing habits. It's about getting outside and exercising. It's about competing with teammates. Um, and, and, you know, for me, which is what one of the things my dad always pushed on us, it was find passion. Like, what are you passionate about? So my dad used to tell us every single day, don't play basketball because of me. If you love basketball, play. But if you're playing because you think you should, find something else. I don't care if it's church. I don't care if it's education, if it's music. He wouldn't let us play football. But <laughs> any other sport, go all in. Whatever you're passionate about, go do, like, put your time and efforts into that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to my kids' games because I'm unemployed here, <laughs> and I have time to go and just sit back. Right. This is their lives. It's your, it's our jobs to kind of guide them and correct them when they make mistakes, but push them to enjoy themselves, push them to have fun, uh, push them to find, uh, find their passion. And if that's sports or if that's the sport you want them to play, that's, that's even better, but right. let them get there right. because at the end of the day, you're, the chances of making it to the, the highest level are very slim. And if you are going to make it there, you better have a passion for it because it's hard. And if you're, if it's hard work for you, as opposed to something you're passionate about, it becomes even more challenging. Um, so enjoy yourselves, enjoy your childhoods, uh, and, and have fun. Some good advice for parents, have fun. Don't push your kids too hard. Really enjoyed this interview. Hope you did too. Luke Walton, this has a great perspective. You know, oftentimes it's missed people that make everybody else better. Don't just think about your personal achievements. Think about how you can make your company better, your team better, your family better. What are some things you can do to become a champion of the people around you? That's what I got from this interview. I love that about Luke. He figured out, look, I'm not going to be the high scorer in the Lakers, but I can make great passes. I can make these guys better. I can feed them shots and make sure that they love having me on the court and find a place for myself in the NBA. Well, I hope you enjoyed this interview. Remember, the whole point of this stuff is so that you can find little ways to be 1% better each and every week. I hope you found a couple of nuggets from this interview that you're going to take with you on carving out a place for yourself where you're the best teammate you can be and you're making everyone around you better. Thank you for listening to the Mindset Forge podcast.